As you probably guessed, we're starting a new series today. Can anybody tell me what the name is? God's Messenger. I'm glad some of you weren't asleep. So, as uh, some of you have already um, probably noticed, typically around October-ish, somewhere in there, we typically uh, take up a harvest offering. And uh, we have not actually spoken a lot about that. We've sent out a couple of emails um, concerning it, saying that you know, it's still happening, but we haven't said a whole lot. And some of that has to do with the fact that this whole COVID thing throws everything out of whack. And, um, and some of that is some of the reason we haven't commented about it yet is because we're, we're doing things a little differently with harvest offering this year. Um, I've said this in the past. Uh, if I tell you that we're taking up an offering for something specific, that's where that money is going to go. So uh, this year, what we're going to do with the harvest offering is we are in much need of parking. How many people can say amen to that? How many people have to walk more than a block to get to church? <laughs> I do because I walk to church, but that's... So what we're going to do is this empty lot over here is we're going to pave that and make that into parking. And we're estimating that we could probably get somewhere around 18, 18 parking spaces over there. To do that, it's going to cost quite a bit of money. And so all of the um, uh, harvest offering that people give is going to go directly to that. Um, it's going to cost uh, somewhere about $60,000 to level all that off, put in the drainage that we need to put in, and, and, and get it uh, paved. Um, the, the board has decided that some of the, mon some of the money that we have in a savings account is going to go toward that. Um, and then we're going to try and raise the rest of it. And so we're looking at trying to raise about $40,000 for that. Uh, some people, some pastors will say, you know, it's going to cost about $2,000 a parking space. So if you give $2,000, you're buying yourself a parking space. I don't do that because I might want to park in your parking space. Let me just be real, all right? Um, what I want you to do is I want you to pray about what God wants you to do. Because it's not about how much anybody, any one person gives. It's about how much God wants you to give. You're the one who's supposed to be obedient. If God only has you, everybody in here give a total of $10,000, he'll somehow raise the rest of it. That's what God does. I'm not worried about it. God will take care of it. What, I'm, what I want you to do is I want you to be obedient to what God has called you to do. And so um, what we're, how we're going to do this is we are not going to be able to pave that until um, at the earliest, uh, the beginning of spring. And so between now and then, if you have a harvest offering that you want to give, just put it, put it in an envelope, write harvest on there. And all of that, all of those funds will be put aside and, um, <clears throat> and it will all go toward uh, the paving of the parking place. Now, if for some reason God uh, does a miracle and we raise more than it costs to pave that, whatever is over and above that cost is going to go right back into our mortgage which is what a harvest offering usually goes to. So I just wanted to I just wanted to tell you where we're at with our harvest offering. We're still we're still going to do it. There's no one day that we're going to say this is a harvest offering Sunday. Just go ahead and get. But if you have an offering you want to give for the harvest for the for the um, paving of a uh, nice new parking lot, just put harvest on it. Put it in the envelope. Put it in the offering, and. Um, uh, 
I know I, I, when I get here on Sunday mornings, there's usually not very many cars in the parking lot. But if you go out, um, if, you're, if you get here a little late, you're not going to find a parking spot. You're going to have to walk. And I want to I want to I want to help with that. And I think as we continue to grow, we've been growing. And as we continue to grow, we're going to need that parking that parking area. And so um, there's that. I just wanted to pass that information along to you, so you know where we're at with the harvest offering, what it's going for, and you know one of the things that I like to do is I like to throw a challenge out there and see what God's going to do about it. So that's the challenge. Now it's our responsibility to, to answer that call. So when I was in junior high, it was just a few years ago, I, um, I played football in junior high. And I think it was probably, it, I was probably around 12, 12 or 13, no, 13 or 14, I guess 13 or 14. I don't remember, 7th grade or, or something like that. And we had a kid on our team um, who was held back a couple of years. And he was bigger than the normal kids his age. So I was, I was 13, and he was two years older than I was. So he was 15. Not only was he 15, but he was a big 15-year-old. So he was more like a 16-year-old size kid. And he was playing football with a bunch of 13-year-olds. Needless to say, he was our running back. Needless to say, we won every game that year. You know why? Because they couldn't tackle him. One person can make a difference. One person can change the outcome of a football game, especially in junior high. But we see that not just in junior high. You see that even in today's, in today's sporting event. One person on a football team can change that football team. One person on a basketball team can change that basketball team. Um, I'm not a huge LeBron James fan. Um, I just, I, I think he, he the, the things he stands for um, are not, first of all, are not conducent to um, America moving forward. Um, the, the other thing is, is he's, he's pretty conceited. He's said some things that um, I, I just feel like are pretty conceited. And so I'm not a big fan. But I will say this. He is a phenomenal basketball player. And if you take him, you can put him on any NBA team. You put that one person on any NBA team, and it instantly makes that team better. You could take him, put him on a team with the worst record in the NBA, and they will be, probably they will start becoming a good team. We see it in football too, believe it or not. For those of you who, who know a little bit about football, this, uh, this past offseason, the New England Patriots got rid of their famous quarterback, Tom Brady, considered to be the best quarterback probably ever play the game. Um, they were, for many, 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 many years, the best, if not the best, one of the best football teams in the NFL. Now, without Tom Brady on the New England Patriots team, they, have, they don't even win half of their games. Now, where did Tom Brady go? Tom Brady left the New England Patriots, and he went to Tampa Bay. Last year, Tampa Bay stunk. Literally, they, they were terrible. This year, they are like 7-4 uh, and four or something like that. They've become a winning team. Now, there are a lot of little things that, that go on. But the biggest impact in this was the arrival of Tom Brady. One person can make a big difference, specifically in sporting events. Now, those are, those, are, those are team events. We, you can see this in baseball. You take a good pitcher and put it on a terrible team, and it becomes a good team. L 
listen, you have a good you have a good pitcher, and you can win the World Series. Now, granted, a pitcher is not going to pitch every game. So one pitcher is not going to make them win all of their games because that pitcher is not going to pitch every game. But it, he makes a phenomenal impact. It's amazing what one person can do. And that is, is no different in the sporting realm as it is in the spiritual realm. While we are not playing a game, there is an amazing thing that happens when one person lives up to the call God has placed on their life. And I want to look at that. We're, we started a new series called God's Messenger, and we are going to be looking at the prophets. Now, in the, in the Bible, you will find that there are, there are four uh, books that are considered what they call major prophets. And the only reason they're called major prophets is because they are they're long books. And, you, and that is um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then you have 12 minor prophets. And they're called minor prophets not because they're not as important, but because their books are really small. And these 16 books of prophecy is what, what they're called, is, are what we're going to be looking at in this series. Now, those are not the only prophets in the Bible. Um, you, there are several other prophets in the Bible. Samuel was a prophet. Moses was a prophet. Um, Elijah and Elisha were both prophets. So there are other prophets in the Bible that do not have books uh, named after them or written by them. And we're not going to really focus much on those. We're going to just look at the books of the Bible uh, that are written or named after a prophet. So today we're going to start um, by looking at Isaiah. Uh, it's interesting, it's important to understand when we talk about prophecy and prophets, what a prophet does. And a lot of people have this understanding that a prophet is somebody who tells about the future. Um, and <clears throat> while that is part of what they do, that, believe it or not, is not the majority of what they do. The majority of what they do is um, tell about what has been what, and what is. And after they tell about what has been and what is, then they tell about what could be. So for Israel, uh, and, and we see this in Isaiah, the first five chapters of Isaiah, we see Isaiah telling uh, Judah and Jerusalem how terrible they are, how they've abandoned God. So the first five books, and then even chapters 7 through 12, is the same kind of thing. What, what Isaiah is doing in these chapters is he's telling Israel, not, or Judah and Jerusalem, not the future. He's telling them how bad they've been in the past and how corrupt they are now. And so when we look at prophecy, when we look at prophets, it's not just about the future. Oftentimes the future comes up because of what they have already said about the past and the present. Now there are some times where they, act, they actually just talk about the future. Um, Daniel is one of them, and we're going to look at the book of Daniel. It, 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 the book of Daniel is really amazing when it talks about the future. Um, but most of, most of the prophecies that we read about, most of the future telling that we read about in the Bible has to do specifically with Israel's response in the past and in the present, Israel's response to God or Judah's response or the, or the, the people living in Jerusalem, their response to God. So Isaiah was a man, <clears throat> and we will not be going through the books chronologically. Up to this point, for the most part, everything that we've talked about has been chronological. We went through the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. <clears throat> then we went through uh, Joshua and Judges 
and then Samuel, and then uh, Kings, and we threw Chronicles in there. And so it's been pretty much chronological. Now we're going to kind of take uh, a different route. We're going to go through these books uh, in the order they are in the Bible. So the first one you find in the, in, in the Bible is Isaiah. So that's going to be the first one we talk about. Isaiah was a prophet who prophesied um, <clears throat> specifically during the end of King Uzziah's reign. Um, if you remember anything about King Uzziah, he had a very long, 52 years he reigned in Judah. And it was very prosperous reign. God had blessed him. He was considered one of the good kings of Judah. If you remember, remember when we were talking about the kings, I said a couple of things. One is that not all the kings were all always bad. And not all of the good kings, not all the bad kings were always bad. Some of them did actually some good things. And not all the good kings were always good. Sometimes they did some bad things. Uzziah was one of those. Uzziah uh, was reigning. He was doing some good stuff. And then he got cocky. And he did something that he was not supposed to do. He went into the temple. And he wasn't supposed to do that. And because he did that, God gave him leprosy. And he spent the next 15 years isolated as a leper. So this is, this is the time in which Isaiah comes on the scene. And we read in, in chapter 6 of Isaiah, starting with the verse 1, it says, It was the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robes filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the, the temple to its foundation, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live amongst people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's army. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, the coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am, send me. Amazing Amazing call. It would be awesome for God just to present himself to you like that and say, hey, this is what I want you to do. I mean, it would solve a lot of problems, right? It, it would solve some of that, well, is this really what I'm supposed to do? Or is this, I mean, am I, am I really supposed to do this? Hey, that eliminates that. And as amazing as this call is, I don't want to spend much time on that passage. And here's why. Because as important as that passage is, most pastors stop there. And the second part of chapter 6 gives some insight into what Isaiah was really, what God was showing Isaiah he was really going to have to go through. And I wanted to get to that. But before we get to that, I want to highlight just a couple of things. One um, there are three things in this passage that I want to look at real quick. One is that in verse 1, it says, It was the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. Okay. Look in your Bibles. If you, if you have your Bibles, it says the Lord. When the Old Testament talks about Yahweh, Yahweh, it uses the, the word Lord Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Correct? Okay, if you don't know, it is correct. I was right. But here, if you look in your Bibles, it says, I saw the Lord, capital L, lowercase O, lowercase R, lowercase D. So he, wait a minute. Okay, well, well who's, who is this? If this isn't Yahweh, who is this? 
Because if it was Yahweh, it would be capital O, capital, uh, capital L, capital O, R, D. This term is the word Adonai. You've probably heard that word before. And it is referring to God in a different sense. Now, the Lord is used, the word Lord is used really in three main senses. One, it is um, the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is specifically to Yahweh. Then you have the Lord, capital L, lowercase o, r, d, referring to Adonai, which if you read some commentators, many of them believe that that specifically re refers to Jesus in the Old Testament, even though he is not, say, Jesus. And then there is the Lord, but you, well, it's not really the Lord. It's usually his Lord, her Lord, my Lord, which is lowercase l-o-r-d. And that is just a human being who is your master. So in the Old Testament, you'll read Sarah in referring to Abraham, she will say, my Lord. It was a, it was a, a, a respect that, that wives showed their husband. And it was just that Sarah, it was most of the women in the Old Testament address. Or a, a slave to their master would say, my Lord. And so those are the three main ideas behind Lord. One of them is for Yahweh, one of them is for Adonai, and one of them is attributed to humans who um, are shown respect by people who are under them. Another case for Jesus in the Old Testament, many people believe, some people are doubters, but I don't care about the doubters. So, um, <clears throat> Something else that I thought was interesting when I was reading through this, and I don't have time to ex expand a whole lot on all of these things, but it's interesting that when the angel went, the seraphim went and got the coal and took it back to Isaiah, touched his lips. And I had, a, I, I, for a long time I had an issue with this because um, <clears throat> it was not just what he said that made him sinful, it was also what he did. And I had, I had a, I really wrestled with the idea, well, why is it that he was just coming and touching his lips? Why didn't he just rub that coal all over his body? Because let's be honest, our whole bodies are sinful. But again, this is an, an imagery that we're seeing. And um, Jesus is, what, what God is showing Isaiah is that uh, kind of what Jesus says it is from your heart that comes out of your mouth. The mouth is just speaking what's within the heart. And so when the coal is coming and touching the lips, it is, it is, it is a heart issue. And if you've heard me speak, you know, I, I, I stress this. God cares more about your heart than your actions because he knows that your heart will change your actions, but your actions rarely ever change your heart. The last thing in verse 8, he says, Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? First he uses the singular, I. Then he uses the plural, us. Well, does he not know who he is? I, us, us, I. Um, well, when somebody when, when God calls somebody, when God calls an individual, um, he sends out the messenger. While he sends them out, they are representing the Trinity as a whole. You are sent out by Yahweh, but you represent every part of the Trinity. And, and a lot of people... Um, use this as a strong fact that the Old Testament supports the idea of the Trinity, even though we don't see necessarily Jesus' or, or God's Son listed in the Bible. When we are, when we are sent, I, I, like the, I like the way Isaiah says this. 
He says, here am I, send me. And as I was thinking about that, I asked myself, why didn't he say, here am I, I'll go? When somebody asks you, when somebody asks you to go somewhere, your typical response is either, yeah, I'll go, or no, I won't go. I was, um, if I had, if I had for some reason, um, the church needed to send somebody, say, to Hawaii, right? Okay, for some reason, the church needed to send somebody to Hawaii. We need to send somebody to Hawaii. Anybody in here say, send me? Yeah? Um, <clears throat> I think we, we all would say that. I, I, I know I, Jeanette and I are already praying about when we are going to go back to Hawaii. We went on our honeymoon. It was awesome. Uh, we're going to go back. It would be nice. Somebody else paid for it, but it's probably not going to happen either. So. But we, we all say, hey, send me. There's a big difference between I will go and send me. And, and though we sometimes don't really grasp the idea there is really a difference between the two. I'll go focuses on the person making the decision to go. Send me focuses on the person be, that is sending, not the person being sent. When, you, when we talk about I'll go, it implies an inactive second person. When you say I'll go, that the focus is completely on the person who is going. But when it says, send me, the focus is on the person who is sending, not the one being sent. And so the, the, the choice of, of words, and, and in the Hebrew, there is a difference between the Hebrew word, I'll go, and the Hebrew word, send. So it's not like you could have could have interchange those in the English. You can't. And so there's a, there's a reason why the word send me instead of I will go is in there. It's because it is not Isaiah who is going on his own behalf. He realizes that what he's about to do, where he's about to go, isn't about him. It is about God. With I'll go, self is the motivating force. Whereas with sin me, the one who sins is the motivating force. Who motivates you to do what you do? Is it yourself? Is it, your, is it God? Is it your spouse? Who motivates you to do what you do? And, and it, there's, it's important to know that because if God is the one motivating you to do what you're going to do, God never changes. If it is yourself, let's be real, we're all wishy-washy. You like that technical term, wishy-washy? We are. We are. Sometimes we're highly motivated. Sometimes I get up in the morning and I, I get to the office and I get everything done I need to get done by 11 o'clock. Sometimes I'm laying my bed, other days I lay down at night thinking, I just did not get enough done today. God's not like that. And so we need to understand that our motivating force needs to be God. We need to say, send me. And here's why. Because we can only reach our destiny when we are sent by the one who knows our destiny. We can only reach our destiny when we are sent by the one who knows our destiny. So you want to be, you want to reach the, the destiny that God has for you? Allow him to send you. Don't just say, I'll go. Allow him to send you. But there's a there's a there's a there's a, a catch, I guess you could say, in this, and that is that when we are sent, we must also understand that we must have an attentive heart 
and mind. If God's going to send us, we need to listen to what God is saying when he sends us. Because if we don't listen, it's easy to make a mistake. Okay, how many people in here, maybe you're, you're online, if you can raise your hand if you're sitting at home too. I can't see it, but for dramatic effect. How many people in here know Shenandoah really well? Raise your hand up high. Okay, so follow me. If I was to tell you, or tell somebody who doesn't know Shenandoah very well, if I want to tell them how to get to Walmart, I would tell them, okay, you get out on this road out here at 6th Avenue, okay, you're going to go this way, you come to a stop sign, you're going to turn left, you're going to follow that road all the way down to the stop sign, you're going to turn right, you're going to follow that all the way down to the light, you get to that light, you're going to turn right, you're going to follow that to the next light, you're going to turn another right, and where's that going to take you? Into the parking lot of Walmart, all right? Here's what happens if God's giving you direction and you don't pay attention. You might miss turning left. You might miss by turning right instead of left or left instead of right. So, so God made it very clear, but you weren't paying attention. So you, you get out on 6th Street and you go this way and you come to the stop sign. And you, yeah, he said turn left. I'm going to turn left here. And you go down to the next stop sign. And, and this is where you weren't quite paying attention. So instead of turning right, you turn left. And you turn left and you follow that road, you're going to go a long ways before you hit a red light. I don't even know if you will hit a red light on that road. I haven't been down there very far, but I know, it's, I know it's a long ways. You see, when God sends us, if God tells us to do something, he sends us somewhere. we got to be willing to go, but we have to pay attention. Otherwise, we won't reach the destiny that God has set for us. Now, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Because when we do make those mistakes, when we do... Make a wrong turn, God's great at getting us back on course. He doesn't let us just wander off out into no man's land. When he sees that we took a left instead of a right, he'll either have us do a U-turn or he'll have us go down to the stop sign, take a right, go to the next stop sign, take another right, go to that stop sign, and not a, a, a straight left but a curve to the left, and then we'll follow that road down if you know where I'm at, it'll take you to the, to the red light, and then you go right, you take another red light, and then you're in the Walmart parking lot again. That's what God does for us. Now, did I confuse anybody completely from all that? <laughs> you see, God wants to send us. But, but along with sending us, we have to be attentive in our heart and our mind to the direction he is sending us. In a, in a side note, God never sends you out to do nothing. God never sends you out to do nothing. So if you have given your life to Jesus and you want to do what he has called you to do, sitting at home, watching TV all day, it's probably not what he's called you to do. Not that TV is bad and not that sitting at home is bad. But there's always something that he has called us to do. So let's continue. Now, the, we know that God says, I want to send somebody. And Isaiah says, hey, send me. I'm right here. I want to go. Send me. Here's what God says, verse 9. And he said, yes, go and say to this people, listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but, do, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of those people. Plug their ears and shut their eyes. That way they will not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts, and turn to me for healing. If you were like me before I went to Bible college... You are probably thinking God is a cruel person reading that passage. Because it seems to say 
yeah, okay, you need to go, but, but they'll listen, but they won't understand. You're not supposed to, to, to speak to them in a way that they're going to be able to understand. In fact, you, you, they're supposed to watch, but they aren't going to learn anything. And I was confused because, again, this is the whole translation issue that we have. I talk about this frequently, that sometimes we don't understand things the way they were supposed to, they were written because of not only are we removed thousands of years, but also the language is different. So I did a lot of research in, in, in a lot of translate. I read all the translations I could find and, and some, of, some, some scholars who know the Hebrew language. And here's the idea that what he is really wanting Isaiah to understand. And it is this. He says to Isaiah, or he says to Isaiah that the people that he's speaking to, the people who he's speaking to, will be ever hearing. They will always be hearing, but never understanding. They will always be seeing, but never perceiving. And he tells Isaiah, your words will make the hearts of this people callous. It will, be their ear, uh, it will make their ears dull and their eyes closed. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. So what he's saying is that the people are going to see, the people are going to hear, but what they see and what they hear are going to drive them further away from God because they have no desire to repent. And sometimes that's what happens. Listen, if you, if, if you, if you know somebody who is angry at God and you and you tell them the truth about God, it drives them further away from God. If you, if you are talking to somebody who loves sin, and you tell them the wonderful things about God, it's going to drive them further away from God, because they have no desire whatsoever to give up their, their lust for sinful life. Now, if you talk to somebody who, is, who has just a, a small part of their heart sensitive to the moving of God, saying these things, saying what wonderful God is, how God uh, loves them, will, will, will take that small part of their heart and it will help that part grow two sizes bigger. As in, you guys know what movie that's from, right? There you go. So, you know, when, when God is telling Isaiah to go do this, he's not saying, hey, listen, I want you to go do this, but what you're saying is useless. God never sends you out to do something that's useless. If God tells you to do something, I don't care what you think about it, it's going to be useful. What God understood about the people is that the people did not care at all about God. And what Isaiah was going to do was going to drive them away from God. And we wonder, well, why would God allow that to happen? Why would God send Isaiah to the people if he knew that what Isaiah was going to tell the people would drive them further away from God? Why would he do that? Because the only way that a, a remnant can come is, is, in, is when the place where the people are is desolate. Let's read. Then I said, Lord, how long will this go on? How long will he have to speak to the people and how long will they reject? And he replied, until their towns are empty, their houses are deserted, and the whole country is a wasteland. What he's talking about is the exile. We just got done doing a series called The Return from Exile. What he's saying here is that because, the, because Judah and Jerusalem have hardened their hearts toward God and are, are, are determined not to return to God, 
They're going to be taken into captivity, and the land is going to be desolate. Until the Lord has sent everyone away, and the entire land of Israel lies deserted. If even a tenth, a remnant, survive, it will be invaded again and burned. But as the terebinth or oak tree leaves the stump when it is cut down, so Israel's stump will be a holy seed. God was not telling Isaiah to speak to the Israelites or to, to Judah and to Jerusalem. He was not telling them to talk to them and, and, and cause them to run away or to, to move away further from God because that's where the story was going to end. He knew that there was going to be something better that comes Later on, I have in my backyard, um, close to my house, I have these two trees. <clears throat> and um, both of them I cut down to about that tall. They're just stumps. And um, every spring, that one stump that's this tall has uh, branches growing out of them this tall and it happens every spring you would think I'd be smart enough just to grind up the, the stump and get rid of it all together but every spring you see the growth come that's what he's that's what he's talking about here that's what he's talking about the holy seed the stump that was Israel is going to be a, a holy seed these last three verses Tell us about God's redemptive plan for his people. And, and that, is what Israel, that is what Isaiah was wanting for himself and for the people. Redemption. The, 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 the bad part about this, and, and it's going to be the same thing for us, although we might not have to suffer as much as he did, I mean... Many, many histori biblical historians believe that Isaiah was cut in two with a wooden saw. And I don't think some of us have probably ever uh, experienced that, but we will experience having to talk to people who are going to either ignore us or dismiss us. People who are going to ridicule us and make fun of us because we are speaking the truth of God. It's exactly what the is the, the uh, Judah and Jerusalem did to Isaiah and many of the prophets. Why? Because these prophets didn't tell people what they wanted to hear. They told them what God wanted them to know. And many times, it wasn't good because people were living in sin. Isaiah, Isaiah was obedient to God. Not because of he expected anything great out of it or that his, his obedience depended on people. His, his obedience depended on God. And our obedience should not depend on other people's response. But should, but, but. Our obedience should be our response to God. If your obedience is based on other people's response to you, you will never be obedient because people are not going to respond the way you think they should. Listen, Jesus was perfect and people hated him. How much more do you think they're going to hate us? who try to speak the truth and are imperfect. But Isaiah, and like Jesus, didn't allow their obedience to be dependent on other people. They allowed their obedience to be a response to God. And that's where we're at. 
We are all called. We are all, God desires to send us all out. He has a purpose for everyone. And obedience needs to be that we love God, not that something great's going to happen, because we just don't know whether something great is going to happen or not. I do know one thing. I do know one thing for sure. It's all said and done. When people's day are over on this earth, there's a heaven waiting for those who are willing to listen and heed the call that God has put on their life. You want to answer the call, whom shall I send, who will go for us? You do that. You remain faithful. And I don't, whatever you face on this earth, I don't care if you become a martyr for your faith, none of that will even compare to the glory that we experience when we get to heaven. So when you face hard times, remember, there's something far better awaiting you if you just persevere. We're going to take the next couple of moments and close the service uh, by partaking of communion. So if the um, those who are helping with communion will get prepared. <clears throat> communion is one of the important things that we should do in our lives. And and while I, I, I don't necessarily have a regular schedule that we do communion, um, it's important for us to prepare ourselves when we take communion. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that if we um, do not take communion with the right heart, we better not take it at all. Better not take it at all. So I'm going to have, um, once the, uh, everybody gets in place, um, we're going to, the, the musicians are going to start, and you just come up, grab a cup and uh, a, a cracker, and then go ahead and sit down, and then we'll take communion together. Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, 
the Lord Jesus took some bread, gave thanks to it, then broke it into pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice your, body, your son gave, the broken body that we can be saved. Thank you. Let's partake of the bread. He goes on and says, in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Jesus, thank you for being obedient, for allowing your blood to be spilt to take away our sins. We didn't deserve it. But you freely became obedient even to death on the cross so that we could be reconciled to the God that loves us. We thank you for that. Let's partake of the cup. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. front of the baptismal over there it says do this in remembrance of me let's not ever forget the price that was paid for our holiness the price that was paid for our righteousness the price that was paid for our reconciliation with God because it was a big one Close in prayer. You have called us and desire to send us out. Lord, I say, here am I. Send me. Be the motivating factor in my life to fulfill the call that you've placed, to reach the destiny you have in place. So that I could be the one through your power, through your spirit, and through your direction. That I not only go where you've called me, but I influence people. That I encourage people. That I draw people closer to you. That my life will be a, a reflection of the light and the glory that you send out. Let my life not just be a series of obedient acts, but let obedience define my life. And all that I say, all that I do, with every fiber of who I am, We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And everyone say, amen. All right. Thank you. I love you guys. Look forward to seeing you. If you're interested, just if you're interested, this Wednesday, I'm actually going to be going pretty in-depth into the first part of chapter 6 of Isaiah, talking and looking a little bit about heaven. So if you wanted to find out a little bit more about heaven. I encourage you to be here this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock. I love you. Be blessed. And we'll see you.